the interior cargo lights turned red, indicating that the C-17 military aircraft had just entered Afghanistan airspace. 32 minutes later, the aircraft descended into a steep landing approach, the pilots wanted to get out of the air as quickly as possible without crashing, so they didn't become a Taliban target. During the mid-1980s, Russian invasion, the CIA supplied Stinger missiles to the Afghan fighters to shoot down Russian planes. These same weapons were used to take down U.S. aircrafts. One passenger, Chase, a CIA special ops agent, was not old enough to remember the Russian invasion, but he'd heard enough stories from the older agents to know it was a modern-day disaster and another great loss for the agency. As the plane's landing gear lowered, the seasoned soldiers leaned away from the windows of the plane to avoid a sniper's bullet. The new arrivals followed without having to be ordered. Chase had been here enough to know, it is the pilots the snipers wanted. The ramp opened immediately after the plane landed. All the men that piled out onto the tarmac would be going with Chase the very next morning and into the Kandahar mountain system. That evening, the camp commander, Major Campbell gave a briefing about the next day's mission. One week ago, an army infantry unit, while on patrol, went into the Kandahar mountains and vanished. Prior to their disappearance, there was no communication and no tick, short for troops in contact. Before daybreak, a C-47 Chinook will be dropping you off, in the same location the missing infantry was known to be. Lieutenant Murray, and Clark, you do not need to know his last name, I'm not sure he even has a last name, will lead you into the area where we believe the troops would have been. We suspect that, that the Taliban most likely killed them. It is your mission to retrieve the bodies, any weapons and equipment, and call in a chopper for retrieval. The CO asked Chase if he had anything to add. The agent shook his head no. I advise all of you go to the mess hall and eat all the carbs you can. They will be better for your stamina than meat. The major advised, I'll see you when you get back. The men felt some reassurance that the major was confident they were coming back. Morning came quickly. The eight men were already off and in the air. After a 40 minute ride, the army ranger offloaded, not knowing if this would be an ambush, at once their training kicked in and they assumed defensive positions with their weapons pointing in every direction. After a moment of calm, where every man heard himself breathing, there was no enemy fire. The lieutenant motioned for two men to move forward and take point. They tactfully advanced in the direction of the mountains, then stopped to take up a position of suppressing fire. One of the men signaled an all clear, and the lieutenant sent two more men forward to overtake the first man's position. This type of maneuver continued until all eight men were against base of the mountain without incident. Just ahead is what looked like a wide animal path, maybe even a goat trail. The lieutenant motioned for his point men to recon the top of the trail. Just around the corner, they found debris, torn and bloody uniforms, broken and shattered equipment and weapons laid scattered everywhere. The lieutenant and Chase, crouched behind a large boulder, and it didn't take long before one of the men that took point to come back around the side of the trail so his team could see him. He gave a hand signal for the lieutenant to join them. Chase at once rushed up the trail without waiting for the lieutenant. Chase was not in the same shape as the army rangers, so at the top of the trail where the two recon soldiers waited, out of breath, he dropped to the dirt and unsuccessfully fumbled for his canteen. Without looking back, one of the rangers offered Chase his canteen. Chase took it and gave him a winded thanks. After a brief discussion, the lieutenant signaled the rest of the men to join them. At the top of the trail was a rocky outcrop, a rock shelf, with three cave openings, there was no safe place to take cover, so two men stayed on the trail, with the other six soldiers, including Chase, and sought a covered position just off the trail and onto the mountain slope of Fallen Rock. Lieutenant Murray, nodded for Corporal Mason, one of the men still on the trail, to investigate the cave's entrance. As Mason rose from his lowered position, a giant spear with a stone tip launched from the darkness of the center cave opening and pierced through the body of Corporal Mason and into the rock wall behind him. The men waited for the lieutenant's order to fire. Lieutenant Murray, so shocked at what he saw, froze. Then, from the center cave, appeared a 12 to 15 foot tall giant with long red hair on his shoulders and red beard. The monster of a man had to lean down to exit the cave opening. 
immediately all seven of the remaining men were overcome by the foul stench of wretched rotten flesh. Without any hesitation, the giant ran directly towards the fallen man to retrieve his spear. The second man on the trail didn't wait for the lieutenant's order to fire, he opened up and as he did so his entire squad opened fire on the red-haired giant dressed in animal skins. As fast as Corporal Mason died, so did the giant. The giant's body was riddled with bullet holes and his head was partially missing on the left side from a 50mm round. Two men dead, one a decorated army ranger, the other a giant from ancient stories told by old Afghan men around a night fire. The soldiers rushed to the corporal's body. The radio man called for an evac. Chase, the CIA agent, called for another chopper to take away the giant. He climbed up to the rocky outcrop to get a better look at the creature. The giant's blood was red, much darker than the creature's hair. Chase was the only one not shocked at what they discovered. He knew what they were going to find. This wasn't the first time men were reported missing because of a giant red-headed man monster. On the ground, outside the three caves, were bones, lots of bones. Human bones and animal bones mixed together, one on top of the other. He began to worry that there might be a female or even child nearby. The smell of death was so strong, Clark almost retched. Flies were swarming the cave opening. It looked like the monster ate the meat off the bones and tossed the bones. Chase didn't see enough human bones in front of the cave openings to account for all the lost men. There must be more inside, maybe people caged for later meals or even hanging from the ceiling being bled out. Chase shined his flashlight into the cave and across the ceiling. This wasn't a government issue flashlight. This was a 1 million lumens he purchased from the internet himself. The light illuminated the entire inside of the cave. In his other hand, he held his semi-automatic 45. The cave floor was carpeted with more bones and a stronger odor, the smell of death that had always been with him. He called out for two men with lights to go with him. Lieutenant Murray sent up two rangers that were eager for payback for what happened to Mason. Clark didn't mind they were gung-ho. Clark then thought through the emotion of watching Mason die. Reason took hold and he didn't see any logical explanation to kill any more of these creatures. It would be better to take them alive. He told the two men to return down the path. Just as they backed out, he heard a moaning cry from deep in the mountain cavern. 